So welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the break and had the opportunity to connect and network. And now we're going to turn back to the agenda. We'd like to hear updates from our federal partners. As you know, standards like Lloyd, Snowman, HL7, and others are important elements in federal initiatives. In this session, we're going to hear updates from some of our federal partners and hopefully have some time for Q&A. First, we'll hear from, is it Patrick? It's Patrick or Sarah? Patrick? We'll hear from Patrick McLaughlin from National Library of Medicine, then Sarah Armisen from ONC, followed by Lorraine Wickheiser from CMS, and then Keith Campbell will join us virtually, and Keith is from the FDA. All right, Patrick? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick McLaughlin. I'm with the National Library of Medicine. Uh, I'm head of our terminology QA and user services group, uh, which you're probably familiar with several of our products and services, RxNorm, SOMED CT, uh, LOINC, uh, DMLS, and uh, Value Set Authority Center. Um, so I'm going to give uh, sort of an overview of NLM, a quick overview of NLM, and then some product updates. Uh, so the National Library of Medicine is a global leader in biomedical informatics and computational health data science and the world's largest biomedical library. Our legislative mandate is to collect, curate, and disseminate biomedical information and literature. We do this through our literature resources like PubMed and PubMed Central, our vast molecular biology and genomic clinical trials, chemical and standards tools. And while we're a, a library, we are not a typical library. Um, whoops. Uh -oh. Hang on. Um, we're not like other academic libraries. We don't have a lot of patrons or students crossing our thresholds. Our users predominantly come to us electronically. Uh, we share commonalities and collaborate with the National Agricultural Library and the Library of Congress, two of the other five uh, national libraries. And we strive to uh, stay in, in the scope lanes for what we collect uh, to reduce duplication and maximize uh, what we collect. The majority of our products serve a global audience with a focus on researchers, clinicians, and public health practitioners, students, librarians, historians, and the, the global, uh, the general public. Um, we're also one of the, the 27 uh, uh, institutes and centers at the, the National Institutes of Health. And so we serve uh, the, the NIH and uh, the, the population through research, the research efforts of NIH. And um, so I'm going to have a video, but I'm going to skip it in, uh, in, you know, to make up some of the time I've lost here myself. Um, but the National Library has National Library of Medicine uh, has origins back 200 years um, to the U.S. Uh, uh, Army Surgeon General. Um, over time, the collection has grown, um, and uh, we we've relocated over time to several different buildings, including the Ford Theater down on the, the National Mall. Uh, today, we're at the the National Institute's campus in Bethesda, Maryland, as you probably know. Uh, and you know we we moved there back in 1956, um, and and since then we've moved beyond just a, a, a literature collection, and we've moved into research and development and so forth. Skip that. Um, so here today I've, I'm I'm focusing on standards, um, and so you can see here uh, sort of a brief timeline of some of the the major uh, standards that we we are involved with at NLM. Um, I do want to introduce or talk about MESH for just a second, the medical subject headings. Uh, this is really the essence of why we're in the standards game today. Um, it dates back to you know the 1960s when we first published MESH uh, to index the medical literature and make it findable and accessible. Um, since then, we've grown into other areas. Many of you are probably familiar with these. So the, the Unified Medical Language System, uh, that was a project of our former director, Dr. Lindbergh. Uh, started in project started in around 1986 and was first launched in 1990. Um, and of course, this connects lots of different 
uh, terminologies, ontologies, and so forth, and brings them together at a, at a basic level for, you know, uh, a sort of a baseline interoperability that uh, users can build off of. Um, of course, LOINC, I think you're familiar with that one, but NLM has been involved uh, since the early to mid-90s with LOINC supporting, supporting LOINC and also incorporating it into the UMLS and making it accessible along with these other, you know, 150 or so terminologies. Uh, SNOMAD, of course, moving, you know, moving forward through the years. Uh, I'm going to skip a couple things here. RxNorm, uh, that, this is a, you know, a product that we created uh, at NLM and grew out of uh, the UMLS, where we found a need to, to better be able to edit and, and uh, work through uh, some of the unique nuances of drug information that couldn't be handled well with our UMLS system. So uh, in 2005, we first released RxNorm and made that available to the public. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, these, these standards were, you know, built into legislation through ONC and CMS. Um, and that really is when, you know, they, they took off and, and we see more and more usage uh, since then. Uh, it's growing exponentially. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is that MLM could not have done this, any of this without uh, collaborations and partnerships with uh, our users, the federal, our federal partners and, and, and others. Um, it's, it's, you know, it waxes and wanes sometimes with the various products, how, how much we're collaborative, but all, all of them require uh, collaboration and partnership. Uh, so moving on, uh, just wanted to mention that NLM, uh, so that was sort of the, where we are, where we're getting to. Uh, now we're, we, we're working on the NLM, or we're working through the NLM strategic plan, which you can see the, the three pillars here to accelerate discovery and advance health data, uh, health through data driven, di uh, data driven research, reach more people in more ways through advanced uh, dissemination engagement and build a workforce for data-driven health and research. Uh, so this is this is where we're coming from. This is the foundation of the work we're doing, our focus uh, for the next several years, moving us into the future. And so the, the ultimate vision is to create a knowledge hub that connects everyone with customized health information. Um, and, and standards is just one piece of that, but standards are very important. Uh, you can see several of our products here um, and, and we hope that NLM can serve as this trusted hub of resources and information for the general public. So now I'm going to shift gears. Uh, that, that's, you know, NLM standards is sort of a drop in the bucket of all that we do, and, and we integrate our standards into many of our resources. But I'm going to focus here on a couple updates for some of our terminology products and services, first of which being the Value Set Authority Center. Um, I think late last year, we launched several new features to help out our, our value set uh, authors in the system. Uh, some of them are here, uh, sort of an audit log that allows authors and stewards to review dates for all updates, um, for de definitions, expansions, metadata, uh, and so forth. And so you can better keep track of your value sets that you're either an author or steward for. Um, there's, you know, review status. So you, that there were updates to review status so that you can check, you know, what's the, the status of this value set? Has it been updated in X number of, of you know, months or years? Um, and then, you know, this great new tool that uh, several users were asking about um, is a comparison tool. So you can compare different versions of the same value set where you compare one value set to another. Um, and you can compare the metadata. So you can see, you know, the revision dates and the, uh, the, the definition and things like that. You can also compare at the code level, so you can see what codes are overlapping between the two and, and what codes are unique or missing um, from the, the two versions of a value set or, or several value sets. Uh, this is probably one you're, you're all well familiar with, is the, the LHC or the Lister Hill forms uh, and the form builder. Um, so if you're not familiar, this is uh, it's a tool for building and rendering forms based on the FIRE questionnaire profile. Um, and this has been around for a long time. This is, an, you know, all of these. VSAC is a collaboration with CMS. Uh, LHC Forms, of course, is a, a, a collaboration with Reagan Street. Um, and so lots of updates always coming to, to LHC Forms and the, the Form Builder. One of the big ones this year was uh, our, our, our developer, Paul Young, talked with the SNOMED team, actually presented a, a webinar to them and talked to them and, and heard the need for representing SNOMED, SNOMED codes and terms in an answer list. And so that was incorporated as a new function 
um, in, in the, the form builder. So uh, you can see several other things here. And I, I, I took some screenshots here. Uh, just, you know, this LHC forms, but what's great about this thing is that it's open source and you can grab this thing and, and render it on your own websites, which of course, Loink does in search Loink, search .loink Um, And you can sort of see here, whenever you see a, a questionnaire uh, that you pull up on search.loink.org, you can click that LHC forms button and it'll pop it up into that, that rendering of the form that's interactive and you can add values and, and sort of get, get quantity, quantities and so forth. And um, of course, we've got that tool demoed on uh, our, our Lister Hill page at NLM as well, if you want to play with that there. Uh, another uh, uh, update that we've got coming up very soon, actually, is a new release API. Um, and again, this is a collaboration with our users. Uh, we, we've heard about this one before. Um, so, you know, automating downloads can be kind of tricky sometimes because every 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 standard has a different naming structure for for uh, its updates and its files. Um, RxNorm in particular, we have monthly and weekly releases, so. The, the dates are known each year when it's going to be released, but it can be kind of hard to program against that. So um, what we what we're about to release in November is this release API where basically you can pick a release type like RxNorm Monthly, RxNorm Weekly, SnowMed US Edition. So you don't have to know the date at all. Um, you can basically just say, hey, give me the SnowMed US Edition and the current version, and it will grab that. And, and then you can pair it with our download API and, and pull that file down. And of course, you know, for us, right, just mere mortals, are, as humans, we don't need to be doing that when we, we click on the, the download, of course, but if you wanted to programmatically download these things, this is super helpful. Um, and you'll basically, you know, you can say 11 o'clock on Monday of each month or whatever, go pull the RxNorm monthly and you can program it completely uh, with this, uh, this new feature. So very excited about that. Um, we're going to be testing that relatively soon. So if anybody in the audience would like to volunteer to, to try it out and make sure everything's working okay and, and let us know if there are any, uh, any resources that you'd like to see added to this that we offer. Um, we cover RxNorm, SnowMed, UMLS, and so forth. But if there's anything we, we have that you want to see there, um, we can build that functionality. And so again, let me know. Um, and having said that, uh, here are our conference attendees. You probably know the, the one guy there, uh, Clem. Um, he's been here a couple times. It's my first time attending. Um, and we've got a couple other people, John Snyder and Nick McGraw, um, who are in the audience now. Uh, please do come say hello. <laughs> Introduce yourselves. I'm, I'm excited to meet uh, several of you and talk with you. And we'd love to hear your feedback along the way. So uh, thank you all for your time. And, and hopefully I didn't take too long. But thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Sarah Armson, and I'm with the Standards Division in the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, or ONC. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I'll give you um, an overview of ONC and some of our uh, activities that we partner with Region Streets on. So ONC was founded in 2004 via executive order and then established in statute in 2009 through the High Tech Act. We're charged with formulating the U.S. health IT strategy to advance healthcare through an interoperable nationwide health IT infrastructure. This charge was put into place via the High Tech Act. Um, and that invested um, in CMS to subsidize EHR systems in hospitals and ambulatory care setting. And with that came o the ONC certification program. We fast forward to 2016 and the 21st Century Cures Act was signed into law. And this added requirements for information blocking, access to information through APIs without special effort, and nationwide governments for HIE networks, formerly known as the Trusted Exchange Framework for Common Agreement, or TACA. It is ONC's mission to create systematic improvements in healthcare through access, exchange and use of data, and it's our vision to have better health enabled by data. Our 
2024 priorities include building a digital the di digital foundation for interoperable health IT, making interoperability easy, and ensuring and enabling proper use of digital information and tools. So the primary activity for ONC is coordination, coordination of interoperability activities across a range of interested parties, um, including federal, state, local, public, profit, not, uh, not for profit, uh, private. Um, and along with that coordination role, our objectives include the advancement and development of health IT, and establishing expectations around data sharing. Uh, the ONC activities that support our object objectives include activities around standards, certification, and regulation, um, in which in these activities we coordinate, we invest, we develop policies that advance interoperable health IT infrastructure. And some of those activities that we um, get to partner with Region Street, include two cooperative agreements. Um, the first cooperative agreement um, that we'll talk about um, is enhancing the LOINC standard to support um, U.S. interoperability. And um, there's two objectives for this cooperative agreement, um, a technical objective um, that supports the advancement and development of tools around LOINC submissions, LOINC development, and LOINC publication. And the second objective is around developing LOINC content, LOINC terms, that support the United States core uh, data for interoperability, USCDI, um, and we'll get to talk a little bit more about USCDI in a breakout session tomorrow. Our second cooperative agreement with Regan Strieff um, is focused on a COVID-19 um, prioritizing um, COVID-19 related content and mapping and also upgrading technical infrastructure related to supporting COVID-19 efforts and public health emergency response. For more information about ONC and ONC activities, I have some links here for you. And um, tomorrow we'll have a breakout session where we can talk about uh, the details of these activities, especially the collaborations with Regan Street and Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and Sarah. And now I believe Lorraine is on. You ready? Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Well, again, thanks for having me here today. And um, since I was asked to give a brief overview of what's happening at CMS and interoperability um, and on HIT nomenclature, I'm going to focus on uh, the data element library or the Dell and the PASIO work group, all sponsored by CMS. And I'll go through them briefly. So, next slide. What is the Dell? Uh, so most of you, or maybe some of you, are familiar with the Dell, um, but if not, the Dell serves, I think you have to keep hitting forward, um, the Dell serves as a centralized resource for all CMS post-acute care assessment data elements and um, their responses and HIT codes. It contains the most current information about our instruments. Um, it contains these questions or items and responses and rating scales for these standardized assessments. And you can see from the slide that all the information shared on the DAO, um, and this kind of information is useful in purposes related to exchanging health data electronically. So we have all of our PAC assessments. You can keep going forwards, uh, keep pressing enter. Um, we have standardized patient assessment data, better named as FADES. We have all the subsets. We talk about um, 
their copyright information and how they're used, their HIT standards, including ROINC, which we're so proud of with the Reagan Street, and then other um, uses within the quality measures within each of our programs. Next slide. So I think it's sometimes important to understand how, um, yeah, next slide, sorry, where we began. Um, it's important to understand the genesis of something and how it developed, and then you can get a better picture of where it's going. So the data element library began with an idea, and it came out of the response of the Impact Act of 2014, which again, probably you most are familiar with. If you're not familiar with, you've heard about, and it's the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act. And it really called for industry efforts to promote electronic health record or HIT interoperability, not just for PAC providers, but across the healthcare continuum. It also called for collaboration, which was needed from various clinical and health information technologists, experts. Our own Reagan Street team was there at the very beginning of the onset of the Dell um, and continues to work with us today. We also needed requirements. These requirements were developed through Agile um, use. We tested and deployed new Dell web applications. And then as this Agile capability continued, we were able to develop these requirements into functionality. Um, and that was built into our Dell. Keep going. And functionality, as I mentioned. OK, next slide. No, yep, keep going. Okay, where we are now. So we have a little picture of the um, homepage of the Dell, but we also have much improvement on the Dell. So we talked about functionality and some of the newer things we have um, within the Dell. So if you go to the Dell and you want to pull up any of the information with PAC assessments, their loin codes, their data elements, their various functions and reports. One of the new functionality is you don't have to do the whole name of something. You could just punch in the first couple letters and you'll have a drop down box. So it makes it much easier to search what you want on the Dell if you're not familiar with everything. We also have a lot of content on the Dell. So it contains six settings. Oh, back up. Six settings. Um, there are assessment instruments that are related to loin codes. And as of this past September of 2023, all of those loan codes are updated to all the assessment data elements within the Dell. There's 38 separate versions of the assessments on the Dell. That's um, historical and then also the most current. There's about 2,400 active data elements within the Dell and 17 of those at this particular time are in active collection status. We also have reports. We talked about some of those reports. You can use the functionality to run reports Two of our newer ones are the data element and HIT code download reports, and they um, come in Excel and Excel uh, file, file, excuse me, um, format. And then the other report is new, and it links all the measures that are found in our um, PAC assessments and all the data elements that are related to those measures. So very um, useful for developers and those trying to capture the data elements within each of our programs. And then um, progressing and looking forward, we want to look, look to integrate our fire initiatives, human-centered design. We're actually looking this year to improve and give the Dell a new space lift. So please, if anybody has any feedback for the Dell, if you go there and you find something you don't, that you would like to have that you don't see, or you think it's not very user-friendly, there's a feedback button on the um, bottom right-hand side of the homepage. Just click that, and we're really happy to hear any um, feedback on that. Next slide. So where we can go. So we would like to look into Fire APIs, which will allow um, some of the Dell content to be shared electronically by multiple sources. So whether you're a vendor or item developer, other CMS applications to use for our iKeys, which is our data um, receiving system, and also in the Patio in implementation guides, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, coming up. We also possibly could extend the content in the Dell. So again, open to ideas. We do include acute care assessments or mental health, pharmacy, et cetera. And then the possibility of increasing our universal HIT standards in the Dell. So incorporating some USCDI in the new USCDI plus ICF um, mapping, the international classification of functioning and disability and health. Um, and then also not to ignore um, AI and the um, robotic processing automation, 
which would also help not only on the front end, but the back end of the DAO, making it more useful for um, all of our users. Next slide. Keep going. Great. So I mentioned the PASIO project before, and that start, stands for the Post-Acute Care Interoperability Workgroup. And it's a project that was established in 2019 as a collaborative effort in the industry, pulling together government and stakeholders. And it really was to help folks develop um, fire fast healthcare implementation resource guides um, to, to create these implementation guides and reference guides to facilitate that standardization for HIE across um, the healthcare continuum. Next slide. So you can see here that there are multiple participants within PASIO and it's growing all the time. We'd really love to invite anyone who wants to join, come up with a use case. Everybody is welcome. The information there is on the um, slide if you want to get involved. But this collaborative effort is to focus on advancing interoperable health data exchange between not just post acute care, but other providers, patients, policymakers. And they use that consensus use case driven approach. Next slide. So the PASIO project is really all about um, telling the patient's story. And post-acute care patients are, you know, sometimes are the most complicated patients in healthcare, and they have many stops along the way. It's not usually just a primary visit and they're done. It's an ER visit, <clears throat> a home health visit, a SNF visit. And so the PASIO project really took on what are the complications in here? What are the problems? And they tell that patient's story. You can advance. The patient work group found that its mission <clears throat> was based on patient story and the problems and the lack of standards in HIE um, data. And so what we know is all of these problems mentioned here, poor communication, reliance on patient recall, it creates burden and really in essence in conclusion of all that is if clinicians do not have the right information at the right time for the right patient, then they're unable to do their job efficiently leading to adverse events and at times even uh, could be life threatening to the, to the patient. So we found that the lack of this data has been a major barrier, especially recently to patient care and burden to the healthcare workers. Um, so much so that the Surgeon General last year noted that barriers to this data has been a major contributor to healthcare worker burden and burnout. And then just last year, GAO completed an investigation that noted that post-acute care EHR use and called for efforts to increase this use and information exchange um, to counteract these problems. Next slide. So where we are now. So the PASIO project has um, a couple use cases. We see six of them here, and they're being applied to help develop these implementation guides um, that reflect a patient's transitions through multiple care settings. And today I'm going to announce that we actually have a new use case that we're starting on. It's called the transfer of care. It will be added to the um, PASIO's portfolio. Anyone wants to get involved, any clinician, <clears throat> at any kind of in, um, disciplinary within the system, uh, please reach out and we can have you get involved in that. This is just in the start, uh, starting phases. <clears throat> the use of these cases, so like our functional and cognitive status have both been published and we are now in the ballot phase for our advanced directives and our SPLASH, which you can see on the right-hand side stands for speech, language, swallowing, cognitive and communication and hearing. These are all use cases that we show um, how they connect to the patient as it moves through the healthcare system. And then our personal functioning engagement is our new use case that compiles functioning cognitive and our splash. So that's also going through the balloting process. Next slide. So just some of the highlights that we have in our Connectathon. So the PASIO group does participate in all of the Connectathons. Connectathons. And the personal function engagement is what I just mentioned. It was a collaboration, the co cognitive function and the splash. Um, they have been extremely successful in demonstrating the coordination of care between these interdisciplinary care teams. And our last Connectathon, we actually were able to demonstrate the registration of a digital insurance card uh, to a patient's Google wallet. And thus they were able to uh, um, view their advanced directive from their wallet on their cell phone. 
So making things, all things portable and very patient accessible. And then the next slide. So where could we go? Where are the possibilities? So really all of this um, kind of culminates in interoperability and feedback loops and how can we use that? So interoperability is important and our um, HIT codes and LOIN um, in that it enables that continuous improvement. So feedbacks have, used, have been used continually through the decades, right, in all industries, but it requires access to data to measure that data, to analyze it, and then to adjust that process based on evident, you know, evidence-based results. And so we're hoping that that, <clears throat> excuse me, interoperability enables key factors within that feedback loop. And it can provide um, data for improving it. So we look at an outcome and we see if it's been a success or there are shortcomings, and then they, we can inform clinical trials and share those results and then improve as we go that feed it back, that continual um, re-looking at analysis and data and then improving it as it is applied. So interoperability integrates multiple information sources together in real time and can help reduce some of this duplication and consistency. It also allows for information to be available at the point of care, which is so important to have that right information at the right time. And it brings together the care team and keeping them informed as they need information uh, for the patient. So after all of that information, really the reason we continue to need and work closely with Reagan Street and all those in the HIT uh, community to advance standardization of data through common language and nomenclature is really to advance interoperability and to um, improve the quality of care for patients. And thank you so much today. If you have any questions, please reach out and um, or get involved um, with the Dell or the PASIO project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. And now we'll hear from Keith Campbell from FDA. Um, I'm Keith Campbell. I'm the director of the uh, FDA Shield program. Um, FDA has a, um, a mandate for assuring the safety and efficacy of a variety of health products, um, including uh, medications or drugs and diagnostic devices. And um, that's one of the reasons why we're here. Uh, so let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. And let me try to explain a little bit about where the SHIELD program came from, how it relates to LOINC and why we're here today, as well as how it relates uh, to the FDA. Uh, the project goes back to about 2015, um, when the need for, for a project um, that has been named SHIELD uh, was identified. And the challenge was that different groups were encoding uh, equivalent laboratory tests from devices that are under you know, re review and approval by the FDA uh, in different ways. And so if the same devices are putting out different results for the same test, uh, I would propose that that's neither safe nor effective for the community that makes use of those tests. So in 2015, this need was identified. Uh, Mike Waters, um, uh, was the originator on the uh, FDA side and worked to uh, found uh, informally the idea of a shield community that had industry partners, including um, manufacturers of in vitro diagnostic tests. Again, these would be groups that would bring their tests to the FDA seeking to get approval of them as a medical device, uh, which would mean that it's uh, something that's authorized to provide data uh, that is used in the, the healthcare process. Um, a next step was in 2019, we looked to see um, um, better enumerate or quantitate the, the size of the problem. And I'll give a slide next that will specifically describe it, but we uh, began pilot sites where we were enlisting uh, high complexity CLIA labs um, and you know, groups that would be willing to let us look into their data catalog, look at how they're encoding them. And as that um, pilot evaluation had just begun, the pandemic hit. 
And as a result, COVID-19 testing and the in vitro diagnostic of the medical devices we approve and review really came to the forefront with regard to the importance, not only of getting them approved quickly, but also making sure that they actually worked. And finally, making sure that the data that was returned to uh, both for patient care, as well as to the CDC and other groups for making decisions about how we manage the pandemic, uh, we needed to have really high quality data. And unfortunately, we didn't. And as a result, one thing that happened was the Secretary of Health and Human Services mandated uh, that one of the activities of SHIELD, uh, the uh, LIBID file, would be mandated for use to try to improve the data quality of encoding. And we'll get more again there on the next slide. Um, as part of that, this LIBID spec specification was authored in 2020. Uh, and then we basically group work to develop a roadmap and uh, continue the assessments and then just recently in the last few months, uh, we've uh, gone through the process where SHIELD, the SHIELD collaborative community has formal documents governing their decision-making process and they've been approved as a formal FDA uh, collaborative community. So there's been a lot of activity there. I started working uh, with SHIELD in my role at the Veterans Health Administration. Um, uh, in about 2018, Mike Waters had asked me to, um, to work with the project and bring some of the ideas from the VA Solar Project into here. Uh, and now I've been recruited uh, and uh, am working for the FDA as the program director. Um, and uh, it's just been a great opportunity. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the next slide, please. So I mentioned that the five lab, well, the study that we did, and we call it the five lab study because there's five CLIA high complexity labs that participated in it. And these five labs are not slouches. You know, there's, um, uh, they're, they're, I think they're all at tertiary care facilities uh, with uh, reasonably high volume and some sophistication. The first thing that we were able to show was that among these groups, they only named the same test with the same LOINC code 58% um, of the time. That means that 42% of the time they disagreed with regards to the proper LOINC code assignment. And again, I think that's a sign that, you know, everything may not be safe and effective here. We need to get better interoperability and similar. And I also want to point out that the reason for this mismatch is not because of LOINC. It's because of choices that are made at the laboratory um, space, trying to uh, improve, trying to choose the right codes. And in some cases, uh, they don't update um, when new releases come out. We found that there were some that were using deprecated LOINC codes. And, and, and again, that's not LOINC's fault that um, uh, laboratory systems aren't upgrading their, their, their catalogs in a timely way. But one of the things we also found, and that's thank you for the, the next build here, is that when we looked at that livid file, so the livid file was saying, if you're using this device, here are the set of codes that we think are appropriate for use for this test. That if we, um, if we use the livid file in these five labs, um, the, the mismatch rate went down from 42% to 21%. So it, it's uh, almost a 50% decrease. And, and that was really without a lot of trial and error. I mean, uh, a lot of um, uh, effort. Um, there was just the file that was posted on the CDC website. The different laboratories would download it, was in a spreadsheet form, and they would try to follow it. And I think there's one more build here on this slide. And so basically what we showed was that there's a 50% reduction by just providing some relatively uh, simple guidance with regards to um, uh, coding of, of these values. And we believe that that's a, a good sign that we should try to make that better. You know, So if we go on to the next slide, 
you know, the goal here is that we want to build on the success. We want to try to make it ubiquitous and easy for laboratories to get really good guidance. Um, the livid files themselves were curated in part by the manufacturers of the devices who have the expertise to know what their devices are, are analyzing and, and what factors may, may uh, uh, impact how you might encode it. And so we're trying to work on a next generation of LIVID, which we're referring to as LEADER, or the Laboratory Interoperability Data Repository. And the idea being that LEADER would be something that would be available. Uh, we would uh, work to have it collaboratively developed and maintained. The goal is to the extent reasonable that uh, device manufacturers would contribute to it but also that there's uh, a, a need and a, an ability for the community to participate as well. Um, and the idea is, is that LEADER brings in um, certainly the LOINC code to make sure that we're accurately naming the test properly, but there's also other information such as the, uh, you know, what was the test ordered? What was the test performed? What is the specimen information that's associated? What's the test code that was used to try to key this off the instrument unique device identifier and the test kit unique device identifier um, and make sure that the units of measure are properly uh, represented, that the specimen source side is properly rep rep represented. Were there any specimen additives that were done as part of the analytic process and similar? So this is where we're wanting to go um, and we're wanting to do this in a collaborative way. Uh, we're working to develop infrastructure to be able to um, support this leader development. And this is an area to basically stay tuned. The infrastructure is not stood up today, um, but we're hoping you know, that we'll be progressing this uh, through HL7 with some HL7 connectathons. We're hoping to have some HL7 connectathons in the May timeframe that will give people more uh, insight and visibility into, into the program as a whole. And so then if we can move on to the uh, next slide, part of our goal with this is that we wanna do this in a standardized way. We don't want the leader knowledge base, if you will, to be a one-off that has no ability to integrate with other efforts. Uh, we wanna do it in a way that we contribute open capabilities, open source capabilities to the community so that if other groups want to develop similar knowledge assets and by similar knowledge assets i mean knowledge assets that would build on a foundation that comes from loink or that comes from snomed or that comes from rx norm and to allow people to build uh, capabilities on top of that foundation uh, so there's some similarities here with the value set authority center um, but to take it beyond just uh, uh, lists of codes but also to try to uh, associate important information with those codes that's important for clinical care, interpretation of tests, and for uh, data quality. And so then, if we can go on to the next slide, um, we're, we're trying to, to, to make that integrated knowledge management promise real. Uh, and our goal is that an initial capability is that we integrate, um, you know, SNOMED as a as a foundational source within this environment, LOINC is a foundational source within this environment, and then LEADER is our test case for generating knowledge bases on, uh, on top of that content. But again, we're hoping that the same uh, infrastructure can be repurposed um, easily for things like creating um, you know, knowledge bases for medication treatment or indications of use or similar that also would build on SNOMED LOINC and in that case, uh, RX Norm as well. Um, and again, we're working to make this available uh, and working in collaboration with HL7, and we hope to be having some connectathons uh, uh, and more information available um, in the next calendar year. So uh, if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, that's uh, That's my slides and and I'll, I'll turn it back to the host but of course I'll be here for any discussions and questions that uh, um, anybody wants to raise thank you
Thank you very much for that, uh, Keith. We're actually short on time, and we're going to um, have questions for our federal partners. I want to thank all of our federal partners for their presentations today. And if you have questions for them, we can take them during the break. And Keith, we can reach out to you if people have questions and share them with uh, share them with you, or you can reach out to Keith directly.